Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. I'm really excited to share this show with you today. What this is, is it's an interview I did with a guy who's kind of a local legend here in Southern Utah. Uh, It's a guy named Rex Jones. And he is, especially if you're in the world of uh, cinematography, photography, everybody knows who he is. He's a super, super talented uh, artist, photographer, videographer. And, and, the reason I want to talk to him, the theme of the show is w- what I call the thick end mystic moment and, and what that is. I, I explain in many other episodes where that name came from, but the point is, it's when your life is going this direction and then suddenly it's going this direction and and uh, uh, dealing with change and, and when changes are forced on us or, or changes that we impose on ourselves, how we successfully navigate these things. Well, Rex had a cancer diagnosis several years ago, and I, I, was, I asked him if he'd be willing to come on and visit with me and talk about those significant moments, getting the diagnosis and, and going through all the processes and learning how to deal with something like that when you have a radical, massive, massive change in your life, something that was forced on you that... that nobody wants but then how do you how do you successfully navigate that and and i i think you are going to be just love listening to this interview and all the things he shares about this so anyway i hope you enjoy this interview with rex jones hey welcome to today's thick and mystic moment i'm robert john hadfield and i'm super excited today because we have Rex Jones with us, and he has a really amazing story. I've actually been following him on Facebook for a while, and we're Facebook friends. And we have this show every single day, and, and Rex, we talked a little bit about this, that there's two primary kinds of change that happen in our lives. There are the changes that are, that are forced on us, that we have to figure out how to navigate. And then there's the changes that we impose on ourselves, and, and figuring out how to maintain those things sustain those things becomes one of is one of life's challenges or tricks right. and how to how to navigate those big changes that are forced on us is the is the other big challenge and i know uh, having interacted with you some you've been you were in the studio here a couple of years ago yeah. that's right when we not long after we built I think the I place up i came and visited with david lane and okay Mark oh Mark. that's that's okay yeah i remember that yeah. day for sure anyway i appreciate you being here sure i know that because this is a discussion every day about uh, about change and dealing with changes that are forced on us, I know that you have uh, a, quite a story related to that, and that's why I wanted to, to have you come in and, and just share share that story. Sure. I love it. Yeah, the biggest, most dramatic moment in in my life is a cancer diagnosis. That's, that's the probably the most pivotal one that brought about the most change. So, I was actually in the police academy in Phoenix. I was gunning for a, a job as a state trooper, and I had a straight shot into air rescue out of Flagstaff. I just wanted to go be Mr. Ultimate Badass. And it was in the middle of the academy when I first found a lump in my armpit. Didn't think any of it, just uh, assumed like I had pulled a muscle or something doing push-ups. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ended up getting injured in the police academy. Tore the rotator cuff on the other shoulder, and so they had a, they had to medically dismiss me. And the plan was to roll over into the next class in August. In between that time, I started working for a cell tower company. I was just doing site checks and grounds maintenance, and started that job in like April 2019. And while I was on the road up in Oregon, the, the lump just got a little bigger and really painful. Like I was going through about 800 milligrams of ibuprofen wow, every eight God. hours, like clockwork, like whatever the label said, I maxed it out. And I mean, I didn't go over, but I was, I was chewing through that pretty quick. And I remember thinking, I'm going to kill my liver at this pace. And so 
I'm in Oregon. It you know CBD oil, THC therapy, mm, all of that right, stuff yeah. is it's it's a big thing. And so I tried CBD, nothing, just didn't even come close to touching it. And tried THC, and that also did absolutely nothing for the pain. And so I started coordinating just through phone calls with a doctor here in Utah to figure out when I could get on the schedule which was tough because I didn't even know when I was going to wrap up that job. So it was a really fast paced timeline. I got on their calendar for early July. I wrapped up my cell tower route three days before I was supposed to go in for this biopsy. And so I barely got back in between April when I started working that job, the lump was about the size of a pea. And in July when I biopsied it, it was about the size of a racquetball. Whoa. Three months. Three months. It, it just grew so fast. And it was excruciating. I had to walk around with my hand on my hip because if I had to just let my arm dangle, it would apply pressure to that lump and it would just cause insane amounts of pain. It's the second most painful thing I've experienced. The first was having a plate put on my collarbone after shattering a collarbone and feeling all the screws uh... in the bone. That was rough. And this was, this was pretty close. It just kind of felt like wow. a knife was slowly stabbing me. So the biopsy oh yielded the results of Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we did the bone marrow biopsy. We did all the scans. I was staged out at 1B. So the cancer was in one spot, but I exhibited B symptoms. So lots of pain, noticeable lump, night sweats. I was textbook Hodgkin's lymphoma. So the treatment plan was like six months of chemo and two weeks of radiation, wrap that up a month before COVID hit. So it was, oh, wow. it was a, it was a nonstop thrill ride for a bit. The diagnosis itself, um, it was kind of lackluster. I mean, the, the physician walked in, he's like, well, I don't have the best news. You have Hodgkin's lymphoma and I'm going to set you up with an oncologist and he'll take it from there. And then he left the room. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And, you know, I had enough of a medical background with being a firefighter and an EMT. I knew everything he was saying, so I, I knew I, where I was headed, but I didn't know how bad it was. So, at that time, I, I spent, before I was staged out, I just probably had about two weeks of not knowing how bad it was. It could have been, it could have been a death sentence, and it could have been not so dramatic, and I didn't know for about two weeks. That was probably the most the most intense mental space I've ever been in that fear of the unknown, you know, getting on every blog, reading every article on Mayo Clinic and American Cancer Society, trying to wrap my mind around what my diagnosis actually meant. That was that was intense. By the way, how old were you at this point when this happened? Twenty nine. See, this is amazing because we don't think of twenty nine. Right. And that. Yeah. The fascinating thing about Hodgkin's lymphoma is that it's extremely rare. I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's something like 8,000 cases a year, which is really low compared to other cancers. Leukemia has much higher numbers. Sarcomas have much higher numbers. Most of your blastomas, most of your other cancers have many more cases. There's a lot more breast cancer patients than there are Hodgkin's lymphoma. Super rare. It's considered highly treatable and no one knows what causes it. There's no known cause, no chemical link, no genetic link. Hmm. It's just random. And for whatever reason, most people that are diagnosed with Hodgkin's are between the ages of 15 and 30. Oh, no kidding. It's I didn't a, know that. It's a young person's cancer. Okay. I didn't realize that. I just, yeah. you know, the word cancer, my whole life I've associated it with old people like me. <laughs> Gray hair, you know, that's what I assume. Or even older, with. you know, right. like retirees. Yes. Yeah, people that are in their 60s and 70s, 70s, especially with such a nationwide culture of smoking back in the day. Right. Most people you expect to just have rough life choices in the past manifest themselves much later on in life. But Hodgkin's is a different beast. So you, before we move on then, just so I understand, it was you said 1B... Yeah. One men means stage one? Stage one. Okay. And that's the best stage to be in if you got to be in one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and B 
What does that represent then? So you've got A and B. Okay. Um, B symptoms are things like night sweats or hives or um, dramatic weight fluctuations. Okay. It's it's a it's an other physical manifestation of the cancer okay. itself. And so those are B symptoms. And so there are some people that get the same diagnosis but don't have any of those symptoms. And so they'd be considered stage 1, 2, 3, 4, A. Okay, I see. It's, it's, A means we're not, there's no physical things that are just displaying themselves yeah. necessarily. B means we have secondary symptoms yep. that are making, okay, got it. Got a it. is creepier because you could have cancer and not know it. Right. And so usually people that have an A diagnosis are stage two, three, or four because it will progress so much more without them knowing it. Wow. So okay. as, as painful as B symptoms are, they allow it to You'd get caught a lot faster. It. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so two weeks. Two weeks you're in... Limbo land. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Which I can't imagine, by the way, two weeks of that. You well, know, I, I was contracted to work a, a commercial production, and so I was... I think I was five days off of my biopsy. I still had the stitches in place, and I By was, the way, when you say commercial production... Photography. Yeah. We didn't talk about that, but you're a professional, like, super, superstar photographer. <laughs> so when you say the production, this is what we're talking about. So I will say okay. this. Your flattery game is on point. <laughs> I'm, and I'm serious. I look at <laughs> I, I look at the stuff that you post, and it's amazing. And you, and you had a... I read one of your posts once. You had this really interesting thing that I think about a lot when I do photography. You were... And I, I won't, I'm sure I won't get this right, but it was something along the lines of, I don't just take a million pictures and hope that one of them shows up. I get the picture. Yeah. It was something like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it correctly, but that was your philosophy about it. Yeah, that was the gist. So, okay. Yeah. So anyway, you're a few days away. You've got this two week limbo you're in, and then you're a few days away from a, a big job. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm on set. Um, I was the photographer for the project. We had a couple of the people that were doing video. And, yeah, we've got these fantastic behind-the-scenes photos of me walking around set with my arm up here just because I'm babying the surgery site. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that was, that was kind of painful, and, you know, I was managing that at the same time, but it mentally helped that limbo space because I had something to do. Okay, makes sense. And so I've learned, at least from that one specific experience, working through pain isn't that's not something that i think is noteworthy like it sucks and i don't think that that's not something i would ever want to do or encourage someone to do but i will say that having something and forcing myself to work and be occupied is very helpful with keeping my sanity i think dwelling on it and just stewing about something that i can't control makes it worse and so yeah, I'm kind of pushing myself through it yeah, and just going with it. Maybe Can't control it. and don't even know all the answers yet. And even if I did know the answers, cancer is one of those things where there's no guarantee. They sure. They can't guarantee it. I might live. I might die. They'll do their best, but they don't know. So, yeah, the diagnosis took place July 22nd, and then I started chemo on August 23rd, two days before I turned 30. Wow. So that was a that was a wild week. So what I did, um, most of the people that know that part of my life know the chemo costumes, and so that's that's my minor claim to fame. Is I I remember I was sitting with my oncologist, and I told him, I was like, of all the people that you don't need to tiptoe around, that's me. I'm I'm, I'm at the top of that list. Give it to me straight. <laughs> You can't offend me. You can't scare me. I mean, it's already terrifying as it is, so you can't make it worse. So whatever you feel like you need to tell me, just say it straight. I can handle it. And so he looked me in the eye, and he's like, don't make too many friends. Wow. And I had this moment where I realized my staff have the worst job on the planet. If, they, if they're expecting it to go poorly for most patients, that's so depressing. And I, I remember just thinking about it like, 
yeah, it sucks being in the chair. It sucks being the one hooked up to it, but I can't imagine working my ass off to try and help someone knowing that those efforts could be futile. That would be rough. And so at once I had that realization, I'm like, I'm not going to be the guy that makes their life worse. I'm just not. <laughs> I'm not going to bring more depressing, mopey, self-pity energy to this experience. I'm not going to be the one that makes life harder for my nurses and doctors because I think they've got it bad enough. And I'd say a good section, a good chunk of the people that work in oncology units are former patients themselves because hmm. they have so much empathy with other cancer patients. And so they end up nursing and being caregivers for the cancer unit because they know what it's like. There's a significant number, more than I expected, of people that were survivors themselves. Hmm. Wow. So on chemo one, I went dressed as myself. I went as Rex, and then starting with chemo two, I walked in wearing the most ridiculous outfits I could put together. <laughs> so the first one I showed up as Napoleon Dynamite. Really? Yep. Or I guess the so chemo two, I showed up as Napoleon Dynamite. Chemo three, I went as Where's Waldo. <laughs> For four, I showed up as Woody from Toy Story. Chemo 5 was on October 31st, and so I got a, one of those giant inflatable T-Rex costumes <laughs> and walked in as a dinosaur. Yeah, we did a whole Facebook Live thing where, like, I'm storming through the cancer ward as a dinosaur, like, just ambiguously roaring at random people. <laughs> oh, that is, that's great. Oh, we were cracking up, like... Unless the doctor was actually with a patient, we jumped everyone. It was it was chaos. <laughs> when you say we, you're talking about you. Oh, you, I my dad came with me, and oh, so he's okay. he's got my cell phone. He's like following me around, filming the whole gotcha. thing, and so like I'm cracking up in the costume. He's cracking up holding the phone. We've got probably six or seven staff members that are like just kind of following us around the office as we go go Godzilla on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Rex, what is it that made you th even think to do all this? These these different costumes for <laughs> chemo. That's fascinating. I think half of it was self amusement because I I cracked a lot of jokes. Like I had the most insane sense of humor, and part of it was a coping mechanism. I'll be honest, it was. It was it was to distract myself. But the costume idea, I just remember thinking. What is the one thing that no one is going to expect? They're expecting me to show up in sweatpants. They're expecting me to bring an iPad and headphones and whatever else makes me feel comfy. And they're expecting me to just silently go through this just like everyone else. Right. They're not going to expect me to come in as some wild card. They're not expecting a dinosaur. <laughs> They're not. Yeah. I showed up as a magician. I showed up as Charlie Chaplin. I showed up as really? Paul Bunyan. Um, oh my gosh, this is great. I got one of those oversized t-shirts with like a full body print of a of a bikini body. So I showed up as a bikini babe, had the wig and everything. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is awesome. I, uh, yeah. For uh, my bone marrow biopsy, another very painful procedure. They they use a tool like an awl, and they kind of just like drill into the bone until it pops through. They go right into your hip bone, and just because it's the thickest bone they've got, so there's the most bone marrow. And so I'm sitting on the gurney or the table, and you know, pants down to my mid thigh, so my ass is just hanging out for everyone to see. And my doctor's like, "Do you mind if I?" have some of my other staff come in and observe the procedure because they've never seen it. I'm like, I don't care. I have zero qualms. Do your worst. <laughs> so he called the entire rest of the staff because I was the last procedure of the day. So I think we had eight people in the room. He had done the whole iodine swabbing. He was just like kind of fanning it so it would dry out. Butt cheeks ablaze for everyone. And he's like, okay, we're about to start. Any last questions? And I was like, yeah, serious one. And I looked at everyone in the eye. I said, is this a good enough ass for stripping? <laughs> 
And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I want an answer. <laughs> On a scale of one to 10, go. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's great. Yeah. Well, the, the, the beauty of, of, of all this, if I can interject, is you talk about the the doctors the staff there the depression that they must feel watching people go through pain all that's all they do yeah. and then all the people that are also going through the same thing you're going through that you went out of your way to create an environment that would lighten the load for everybody else that's dealing with that at that moment yeah. it's pretty cool that's pretty kind of awesome Thing to do it was a simple so, thought that sparked it which i didn't actually answer your original okay, question right. which is um i realized no one knows what i'm going through people like to say they know especially other other people dealing with medical situations they're like i know what you're going through no you don't honestly you don't know what's like in my head you don't know what it feels and that's okay it really is okay to be the only person that knows what I'm dealing with. And I realized the only thing that people, anyone knows is how I am to them, how I am with them, how I treat someone else, how I talk to them, how I interact. That's really all that matters. I could be in excruciating pain or I could be feeling, you know, you know, 10 feet tall. It doesn't matter. The way I treat and the way I behave, the way I interact with my world is all people know. And so if I project, if I put negative emotion out there, if, I, if I'm cranky, if I'm snippy, if I'm unpleasant, that's all they get. They don't know the source of the pain that drives that type of behavior. All they know is how they got treated by someone else. And when I realized that it's not fair to put any of that on someone else. No one likes it. And it doesn't matter the cause. Mistreating anyone else in any way is still wrong. And so using cancer as an excuse for being cranky, it's still a <laughs> crappy excuse. <laughs> Had that realization when I, when I got divorced in um, 2018. So a year before the cancer. And I remember thinking... That through because that was that was a pretty heavy emotional thing too, and even arguably mentally more difficult than the cancer. And I remember having a real that realization then, like I was in school, none of my classmates know I'm going through a divorce, and it literally doesn't matter. All that matters is how I treat them, and so that perspective carried into the cancer thing. Where it's like it's no one's fault that I'm going through this, and so. I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that I don't bring anyone down. And if I die, I'm going out making people laugh. I'm not going out making them sadder. So that was kind of where every single joke, every single gag, every single stunt I played <laughs> came from that mentality. Like, no, we're going to, we're going to make it, we're going to make it fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked them, uh, when I started radiation, I asked them if I could take a spider in with me. <laughs> it took them a second. And they're like, no, this will not turn you into Spider-Man. <laughs> That's awesome. And I was like, but have you but tried? Just, but, but have you, but come on, shouldn't we just try? Do you actually yeah. know, like, have we actually tested this out? Or are you just like hypothesizing here? <laughs> they're like, did you actually bring a spider? I was like, No but I will go catch one right now if you give me the thumbs up. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I drew a smiley on my chemo port for my first chemo with a Sharpie. Like, okay. I drew a smiley face on my port, and the nurses pulled back the shirt. They're like, what is this? I'm like, he's just happy to see you. <laughs> so I got him immortalized. He's, he's there for good. That is awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the change i guess to answer your original question i realize that it doesn't matter what happens in my life what matters is what i do with it i'm, I'm pretty convinced that everyone has to go through something nasty at least once in their life death of a parent death of a child cancer diagnosis bankruptcy um, business partner 
stealing. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But there's everyone has to go through something really rough. I think that's just human life. And I don't think anyone gets to live life scot-free. I don't think. I think what matters is you're going to face something at some point in your life. It's going to happen. And you either become better through it or you become worse, but you don't get to stay the same. And I think everyone will run into that in some degree or another. You know, I, sometimes, I, I mean, I know people get cheated on. I know people end up being, there's still way too much abuse out there. There's a lot of ways for nasty things to happen. But the people that seem to inspire me are the ones that don't let it change them for the worse. They find a way to use it for some sort of good, whether it's actually going back to nursing school so that they can become a nurse in a cancer ward, or whether it's starting a charity or nonprofit, or dressing up in the most dumbass yeah. costumes that I can think of. Yeah. And no one gets to stay the same. And whatever happens, it is a pivot point for change. And I get to decide if that change is good or bad. And that was that was that was pretty eye opening when I realized that it doesn't matter how it happened. What matters is what I do with it today. Yeah. So this was back in it was nineteen twenty nineteen, and then six months you went through all this stuff. Did you you hair loss and everything? Oh yeah. Because I, I, I was I was. We were Facebook friends at the time, and I'm kind of watching little by little what was what was going on. So yeah. I didn't know all the details. Yeah, um, I mean, I can I can even yeah. send you a Dropbox folder full of all the photos from this whole story if you want to use sure. them for the podcast. But yeah, for hair loss that happened somewhere between chemo two and three. Remember, I took off my hat, and I had just <clears throat> uh, just lined with hair, like I was pulling strands of hair out and like I had a good fistful every time I'd take my hat on and off and that's when I realized like yeah it's it's happening it's, happening. It, it's time but you got all the way through it yep. and you're now several years several years out of out of it yeah yeah four years cancer free um once I hit that five-year mark they give me the classification of ned no evidence of disease okay and that's that's the best it gets yeah I do have lymphedema as a parting gift from all of that, mostly just from the the surgery. I mean, radiation could have played a part, but um, lymphedema is just swelling. It's edema of the lymph system. So what happened is I had the tumor, surgery, radiation, and your lymph fluid is that fluid between the cellular space that facilitates healing. So if you get a good thump in your body that turns into a bruise, that fluid that creates the bruise is part of that lymphatic system where it's shifting healing fluid to the body to repair the damaged cells. So that bruise is part of that. And since it's not pressurized like the circulatory system, just regular old muscle movement is what moves and shifts that fluid around. And then it slowly gets absorbed through the lymph system into channels similar to like a vein. And then it gets brought into the core of the body and then, you know, recycled through the, the circulatory system. Well, I've got essentially what amounts to a blocked pipe <clears throat> in my lymph system. And the fluid just can't get back where it's supposed to. So it hangs out. And so I've got a nice puffy arm. My, my skin looks a lot thicker. And the healing process on this arm is a lot slower so if i were to go outside and get a sunburn sunburn would probably heal in about three or four days on my right arm and it'd take about a week and a half to two weeks on my left wow okay if i go to the gym and do like bicep curls um the lactic acid buildup affects this arm a lot more than the other and so this arm will burn out about four reps faster than this arm hmm. and if i get a good workout in and i'm sore this one will take about twice as long to, you know, reduce back to where it needs to be. 
So this arm will probably be sore for a day, and this one will probably be sore for three or four days. Wow. What's it called again? Lymph edema. Oh, lymph edema. Lymph edema. Okay. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you one other thing here about this, because this is when you're dealing with something so dramatic. Uh, you talked about your dad yeah. going to the hospital with you. What kind of role in dealing with these big changes in life? What kind of role do other human beings? Or did other human beings play in in that significant role? Yeah. So the cell tower company I worked for, owned by my father. Okay. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So what chemo would look like? Um, we'd show up at nine in the morning, and I'd be in the chair for about eight or nine hours. Yeah. And so we would. I'd be there from about nine in the morning, and then we'd wrap up. I guess it's more like six or seven hours. I don't know. And I, we'd wrap up around like 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. So I was there for a long time. And yeah, I mean, he's still running his business. And so he would come with me to every appointment. He would grab a, a good chair and set up his laptop and get his work done. But he made sure that I wasn't alone. Which seems pretty simple and insignificant. But those little tiny gestures, I think... All right, makes the difference. Big, big gestures between people are nice, but I think just something as simple as knowing that someone, anyone, actually cares, and that while they know they cannot do anything for me, just the simple comfort of knowing that I'm not by myself made a huge difference. I've got several other friends that showed up. I mean, I have a, another videographer friend, Mariah Larson, and she and her husband are great friends, and she showed up with a camera for my first chemo, hmm. and she shot a bunch of footage of just that whole experience. I've got good, high-quality video documentation <laughs> of that, and that's footage that I'm absolutely putting to use. I've, I'm in the middle of making essentially just a short film about myself in using real world footage as flashbacks to my actual story. And I mean, who does that? We've got a, another professional videographer that volunteers six hours a whole day to come spend time with me in a cancer unit. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. Not everyone does that. Another friend, Lauren, um, she lives in South Carolina now, but she had fought her own cancer fight and we'd initially connected through Facebook and she was like I know what you're going through so if you ever just want some company then I'll come and so she did I think she was there for either chemo three or four and she just sat there the whole time and just kept me company we just talked <laughs> nothing else hmm. to do and so those little tiny gestures from friends from family just quietly communicating that I actually matter as a person to them. That's huge. Made a huge difference. Um, we learned after trial and error that the only thing I could really taste during chemo was tomato-based foods. My, my sensation of taste all but disappeared. But I could taste tomato sauce. I could taste pizza. I could taste spaghetti. <laughs> I had a hamburger once and it was the most boring meal of my life. <laughs> I remember thinking like, this is fun to chew, but I literally can't taste this. And then I squirted like seriously an obscene amount of ketchup on it. I was like, oh, I can taste the ketchup now. This is fun. <laughs> wow. So the, the, the pattern every two weeks was chemo day. So I had chemo on Thursday every other week. And I would stay with my parents. My dad and I would go to the clinic. We would be there for six or seven hours. And then we would go hit an Italian restaurant right after. Because I would still be feeling good enough to get one more meal in. We'd always hit the Italian one because that's all I could taste. <laughs> We'd go home. I'd start to feel crappy. And I'd pass out for about 24 hours. Wow. And then I'd wake up. Chemo 1 was the worst. I mean, the worst amount of nausea. Like, I couldn't even sit up. It was bad for like three or four days straight. 
and then I think my body finally just figured out what hell it was going through and it wasn't as bad for the second and subsequent ones. Hmm. Interesting. And then I'd hop back in my work truck and I would be on the road out of town for two weeks straight doing my cell tower job. So my dad restructured my route so that I could stay in the state of Utah. So I didn't have to go to Arizona or Oregon like I originally had to. But yeah, I, I covered every cell tower in the state of Utah from Logan to St. George to Moab. I've been on every single hilltop wow. out there. And while that that wasn't pleasant, I mean, I didn't have much energy. I would be exhausted. I didn't have much of an appetite, so I didn't eat very much. I couldn't ever get enough sleep. I would have these moments of just sheer exhaustion where I'd hop in the truck, I'd point the truck away from the sun to keep the entire cab in the shade, and I'd just slump over that center console and pass out for two or three hours just in that seated slumped position. Then I'd wake up <laughs> and get back to work. Wow. Which, again, that's not fun, but I think if I had just sat and languished on a couch, I think my body would have, I think that whole negative, woe is me mindset could have very easily made it worse. Mm -hmm. So I think forcing myself to just stay busy, to keep doing my job, and I was still running leaf blowers and chainsaws and rakes, and I was doing a fairly physically demanding job while going through chemo, which taught me that I can, I can withstand a lot, a lot more than I actually thought I could. That's an amazing story. It's not a pattern I would recommend repeating. Yeah, I'd imagine. But if, and I, I have people reach out all the time. They're like, hey, my friend is diagnosed with cancer. Do you have any advice? And I usually give them those two or three tips. Find something to do. Stay busy. Stay positive. Don't think about things you can't control. That, that never helps. And that, that mentality, um, it, it came from several different sources. Like I, I, I served a, an LDS, a Mormon mission, and had some rough experiences out there. Um, had a physically abusive mission president. Hmm. Um, the police academy was tough in its own way. Firefighting academy and firefighting itself, also very demanding. When I was doing the police academy, every day we would have the same lines screamed at us, you know, while we're doing push-ups. And one of them was adapt and overcome. That mentality is the Arizona state trooper mindset. Hmm. And we, I mean, we were going through a bunch of different training scenarios and they were explaining the reason why they have us do everything we do in training. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm still tempted to go back and try and do that job again, hmm. but even if I never do what lessons I got from the academy, adapt and overcome, that's all I can do. I can't undiagnose myself, but I can adapt and I can overcome. And if it doesn't kill me, I can make it through it. So, adapt and overcome. It's oh nice, okay. It's on me for good because that mindset is what helped me survive. Wow, that's awesome. That's a, that's a, that is awesome, and that and what a great uh, what a great mantra to have as part of that too. A adaptation, w w this whole concept as we talk about change, that is figuring out how when you have something that's forced on you that you can't that you cannot control. Yeah. How do you adapt to it? How do you navigate that successfully? And it's and that's a big part of it, obviously. I think so. I really do. I think the people that end up doing things in their life that affect the most positive change for the human race are people that have similarly had to overcome something really tough that taught them that lesson so well that they were able to create something good out of it. So if I get, we'll have to wrap it up here in just a second, but if I can ask one other thing, you're, again, photography. Yeah. You're a superstar photographer, and you don't have to be uh, humble about it. I mean, you're really good. And Thanks. I, what is the story behind how that came about? <laughs> is, okay. is there a story behind oh, yeah. that? 
Yeah, so as a kid, I mean, very typical nerdy kid, Star Wars was the number one show of choice. Like, okay. I loved those movies and spent my entire childhood dreaming about being the next George Lucas. Started playing with cameras in high school. Um, I, I basically designed my own college course strategy off of becoming a film director so i didn't follow any strategic track designed by the college i took the classes i wanted to take because i wanted to learn set design i wanted to learn lighting i wanted to do some acting i wanted to do some directing i wanted to know what it was like to do each of these pieces of a film crew with the idea that making it as a director i could empathize with anyone on the crew and be a better director so I shot a lot of film photography, a lot of black and white, 35 millimeter Craig and Dwine film. Hmm. No kidding. Okay. Yeah, a lot. A lot. I took both the courses at the college and then retook them all over again just to get back into the dark room. Probably a stupid <laughs> waste of money because, you know, tuition, but I just wanted to go experience photography and camera work in its most raw form. And the goal was to learn how to frame things up how I want, because in a black and white film still, still image, if I can create the look I want in a single frame, that skill set, that focus translates to cinema, to video. And it does. The way I shoot my still photos is very, very much how I would shoot my video, or how I do. So I still shoot film. I go through a minimum of four rolls of film a year, and this year, I think I'm on roll eight now already. I shoot a lot of film because it brings me back to the basics. I have to double check my metering. I have to rack focus 18 different times to make sure I've got my focus. I've got to make sure my composition is set. You know, take a deep breath, let half of it out, hold it just like firing a gun, snap the shot. It takes so long to get the shot I want on film. And I force myself to slow down and just come back to basics and that exercise makes me better at what I do for work. So I do a lot of commercial photography, I do a lot of commercial video, mostly in tourism. I, I've worked film productions, um, film productions are fun, they're, they're heavy hitting lifestyles, so, I mean that's, that's a lot of 12, 14, 16 hour days on set. And that's not how I want to live full time. So I'll still work film productions, but that's not my full time thing. That's not the lifestyle I want. It's all I'll do that. I'll cherry pick it. Um, I ended up in commercial photography almost by accident, because I did a bunch of video editing after college. Um, I am an official college dropout. <laughs> I I started teaching in college because I knew what I was doing better than some of the people I was taking classes mm -hmm. from and that's just because I was involved in the industry like I was on the forefront right. of Photoshop because I used it every day I was pushing the boundaries of Final Cut because I was using it every day and so when I realized that I'm in a position where I'm actually teaching the instructors <sighs> which I realize sound in, sounds incredibly cocky but I was mm -hmm. so I dropped out and started working full time did a lot of video editing and effect work for about six years and then got burned out from being behind a desk. So then I did the firefighting for a little bit. I kind of took a, a dramatic 180 shift to just break things up and then I ended back doing commercial photo and video in you know, late 2020. So that's kind of the full-time thing now. I mostly work in tourism. So a lot of tours and activities, a lot of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Horses, helicopters, boats. And, um, yeah, all of the stuff I studied to try and go for a Hollywood career really allows me to just be better at showcasing what I do for my clients. Um, one of my favorite rexisms is the best form of advertising is narrative-based. Stories sell. And so I see my job as a storyteller and while I'm not shooting movies for Hollywood, I get paid to tell other people's, other businesses' stories or to craft a story that other people want to experience for themselves. And the story is really simple. Okay. Riding a horse through Zion, taking a helicopter ride around Zion, riding 
a jet ski, going wake surfing behind a boat. I mean, all of these activities, all of the things that I shoot, it's designed to put an idea into someone's imagination of like, I actually want to have that experience. I want to be able to tell that story for myself. And so that's what I love doing is I like finding all of the best things about any given business and telling their story in a way that is appealing to who they actually want to sell to. Filmmaking, advertising, marketing, it's low grade psychology. <laughs> you simply look for the people that already want whatever it is that's being sold and you sell it in a way that helps them realize how they benefit from it. That's all it is. So my approach is very narrative. I, I want to implant a story in your head. And so that whole Hollywood thing, that's kind of where that mindset comes from. And it works. That's awesome. It's fun. Well, you're a master storyteller, clearly. And I, and you can see it in all of your, I mean, just listening to you tell the story today and then seeing the, the work that you do is, uh, is, is really a, pretty amazing so thanks hey thanks for taking the time to of course to talk about this i really appreciate it absolutely thanks for having me on the show absolutely thank you for joining us on another thick and mystic moment we hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you remember you're not alone on this journey Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. <laughs> <laughs>